Coming up on DTNS, Roku has some big hardware and OS updates. Amazon may be launching new Kindle paper whites. And are you ready to talk iPhone 4 yet? Too bad. DTNS starts now. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, September 20th, 2021. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Draffolino. And from Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. And I'm Roger Shang, the show's producer. We were just talking about fruit that is ugly before the show on Good Day Internet. If you want to know more about the fruit that we think is ugly and why all fruit is pretty in its own way, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. That is where you can join our top patrons, such as Matthew Stevens, John and Becky Johnston, and Chris Benito. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. GM CEO Mary Barra said the automaker plans to build direct relationships with chip manufacturers to address the continuing semiconductor shortage. Previously, GM relied on suppliers to buy chips rather than doing so directly. This comes as GM and many other global automakers have had to cut or halt production of vehicles due to lack of chips. Amazon will announce news about our latest Amazon devices, features, and services, that's in Amazon's words, on September 28th at 12 p.m. Eastern Time at an invite-only event, but no live stream. Previous Amazon fall hardware events have featured Echoes, Eero routers, and Ring cameras, as well as more experimental offerings like the Echo Loop Ring and Ring in-home drone. The messaging app Telegram suspended all chatbots using the Russian elections campaign, According to founder Pavel Durov, this would abide by Russia's election silence law that prohibits campaigning during the elections. This comes after Google and Apple removed a smart voting app from Russian app stores. We talked about it on the show. ByteDance's China-focused short-form video app Douyin will now limit users for those under usage, rather, for those under 14 years old to 40 minutes a day between the hours of 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. This new limit will apply to real name authenticated users, and ByteDance is encouraging parents to complete this authentication process for their kids. And ZeniMax creative director Rich Lambert confirmed the next patch for Elder Scrolls Online MMO will make it the first title to feature NVIDIA's Deep Learning Anti-Aliasing, or DLAA. Unlike NVIDIA's Deep Learning Super Sampling, or DLSS, easy to remember, which runs a game at a lower resolution with AI upscaling for better performance, DLAA won't provide a performance boost. Rather, it will use AI to provide extra edge smoothing at native resolution, saving the GPU from the typically resource-intensive task. DLAA requires an RTX 2000 or 3000 series card. NVIDIA also released a new display driver that's certified for Windows 10 and 11, as well as adding DLSS support for 28 more games. Titles that now support it include Alan Wake Remastered, Deathloop, Diablo 2 Resurrected, and Far Cry 6. All right, let's talk a little more about Roku's announcements. We'll start with the hardware. Roku announced the $49.99 Streaming Stick 4K and the $69.99 Streaming Stick 4K Plus with a 30% faster processor than the Streaming Stick Plus. Dolby Vision is included as well and HDR10 support, faster Wi-Fi. All good things, right? If you're a Roku user anyway. <laughs> the 4K Plus model gets a version of the... V Roku Voice Remote Pro that's rechargeable and can make a little noise if you lose it. Both streaming sticks will be available this October. Roku also announced uh, and updated the Walmart exclusive Roku Ultra LT with a faster processor, also with more storage, Dolby Vision, and an Ethernet port. In the software side of things, the company also announced a number of changes coming to Roku OS 10.5. Users can now pin live TV stations from the Roku channel to their home screen for easier access. It's kind of good for Roku live stations as well. The OS also features expanded voice control, so you can now use voice to perform a general content search enter email and passwords and set up screens. Roku says voice data is sent off device to its speech to text partner and the audio is anonymized for anybody who says, mm, I don't like the sound of that. Roku says it never stores the odd, odd login audio and the text goes to the channel partner only. Yeah, some interesting stuff from Roku here. The the hardware definitely seems like they are, you know, checking all the boxes that the recent kind of fire TV sticks that Amazon announced 
uh, uh, put out there. They've really doubled down on voice remotes. So, you know, you're saving 10 bucks from buying the remote separately with the Roku Stick uh, 4K Plus. I guess we're just adding plus to to everything we can't avoid that that's our future. Yep. Um, so, the only so, you thing know, we can think of. <laughs> so at least we have parity <laughs> there. The software stuff, though, is super interesting to me. I mean, the from an accessibility standpoint, right? I mean, just as a as a as a everyday user, having to enter your email and password, especially if you're using a password manager, you got a long convoluted password, kind of a nightmare to have to go through with a little remote and stuff like that. I don't know if I am ever trusting that. <laughs> I, like they can give me all the warnings they want. They can tell me it's all done locally, and I still just don't like saying my password out loud. It seems just to violate every like kind of security protocol we've come to know, right? Yeah, Honestly, I'm, I'm right though, when with, when oh, go ahead, Rob. I was just going to say I'm right there with you, Rich. I I can't see myself speaking into a microphone where my voice is going to be sent to someone else where I've just spoken my password and username. I just, I, I know what they're saying. I just can't do it. It reminds me of, I don't know if, if anyone has been in a hotel lately, but one of the things you can do in a hotel now is you can actually on the on many TVs, you can enter in your own Netflix account or your own YouTube account. So you can watch streaming stuff, you know, that's, you know, your preferences. And it always says when you check out, it's going to delete your stuff. But it's like, but you have my stuff before you delete it. I, I just don't <laughs> feel comfortable with that. And, you know, like I said, out of all of the story that I'm listening to, that is the one that gets me the most. I don't want to speak my password to you and someone third party hears it. When the Apple TV, uh, I believe it was the HD model. So this is from a few years back. Um, and, and Siri was... Uh, added to the remote it was like a godsend because anytime I had to log and this is sort of the early days before now I just use the same few apps all the time and I'm logged into everything but at the time it was like ooh, new apps and and entering uh usernames and passwords and it was a nightmare to do that on the screen with the little remote I was very pro voice uh <laughs> I wasn't too worried about it Probably should have been a little bit more worried about it, but the, the <laughs> convenience won me over for sure. And not to be overlooked here, the adding the live stations, being able to pin those to your home screen. So, you know, Roku is increasingly an ad tech company that happens to sell hardware as like a profitable, semi-profitable side business for them. Being able to pin those and specifically just Roku channels, right? You're not able to pin like a YouTube TV or anything like that station or anything like that. You know, having that and having easier access, a smoother integrated access to that as a Roku user myself and someone who will occasionally, hey, turn on uh, uh, with Jackie, turn on the uh, MST3K channel or something like that. You know, that's a little bit of a convoluted process. It's not that hard be a lot I'd, I'd be using it a lot more if it was front and center with all of my other kind of app entertainment choices and again roku has a, a vested interest in making that as seamless as possible for sure all right next up here ikea announced and apologies to anyone from sweden the swomerk a 40 dollars wireless chi charging pad designed to be installed underneath nearly any desk or table it provides five watts of charging and can be installed under a wood or plastic surface between eight millimeters and 22.2 millimeters thick those are the recommendations from ikea it seems like there might be a little play in there it can be screwed or taped to the bottom of the surface and includes a temp and temperature and power monitoring so you don't you know, set your wood table on fire. It ships in October, and for that $40 price, being able to turn basically any piece of furniture into some sort of wireless charging uh, situation, I know had a lot of appeal uh, for me. Rob, I mean, is this something that you could see uh, integrating into your setup? I, I absolutely could, because I have, you know, Qi chargers everywhere. Um, and it's just, I mean, on, on on one table, I think I have three. <laughs> and it's just, you know, all kind of cables and stuff, you know, you know, cable management for your living room furniture is, is, is where I'm getting to. Um, I love this. And I'm I am so surprised that I, I've not heard of anyone who has done this before. This, you know, this is like, oh, it just makes sense that you could just slap it under the table and charge through it. I'm all for this. And, uh, the, you know, fortunately for me, there's an Ikea literally two miles away from the house. I will be checking these out when they uh, when they get in store. 
And the thing that this also kind of plays into IKEA's drive to be a lot more uh, uh, sustainability focused, right? So the idea being, hey, instead of buying the table with the integrated Qi charger that, oh, I might want to put it in a different corner. So then I'm going to buy a different charger because that's not a convenient charging location anymore. Being able to configure as you move furniture, as furniture moves room or just your placement in the room, giving you one less excuse to not throw out something, giving you more use out of that, I think plays into that overall kind of sustainability mission, which they seem pretty serious about. So I just measured my desk. That's a pretty, pretty hefty desk that I'm sitting at. Uh, just happen to have a ruler right here. And <laughs> my desk is more like 40 millimeters thick. So I think it's important to remember that there are a lot of pieces of furniture where you go, ah, oh, yeah, the nightstand would be perfect. But it has to be a little thin, at least on that top level where you're going to put something underneath it. Yeah, eight not millimeter, impossible. Eight, like for context, eight millimeters is about as thick as like a phone, like your typical like 2021 phone or something like that. So that that is pretty thin. And then so that's like what three stacked on top of each other for for some context. Yeah, so that's that's a really good point, Sarah, too. But that said, I can think of so many places that I would want to, because it's like, you're not losing the wire, right? The wireless charger that's mounted under wherever, you know, even if it's the right plastic or wood um, that, that, it, that it could fit under, it's like, still needs to be char plugged in somewhere. But just having that off of the surface where I, you know, I commonly have lots of cables that just gather around because it's like, it's my little corner where I charge. I don't know, my Fitbit and my iPhone and my Jabra earbuds. And it just, it just be, not that these are all able to be charged wirelessly, but as more and more devices are compatible with that, it just cleans things up. Yeah, that's, that's the big thing, as I said, for me, just getting the wires off of the top of the desk. I can cable manage under the desk just fine, but if I can get them off the top of the desk, I'm going to spill less beverages because I can tell you, I, I don't want to say it's a regular thing, but I definitely have had the times when I have bumped a cord and knocked a drink over because the cord was just wrapped around the bottom of a, you know, of a, of a bottle or something like that. And I think the appeal of this is that this feels actually wireless as opposed to like placing on a charging thing. Like this is, it, this is like, I'm not putting it directly on the charging, but yes, you need to properly align this. And I'm sure, you know, people are going to complain, you know, it's going to be very easy to be not on the charging area or something like that. But like this feels closer to that than just your typical Qi charging mat. Right. So the iPhone 13 lineup was just announced, so that means it's time to ramp up speculation on the next-gen iPhone. Apple analyst Ming-Chi Kuo is usually good for reliable rumors, and in his most recent analyst note, he points to the Apple delaying uh, two long rumor technologies advertising that uh, Apple will delay, uh, let's see, what are they going to delay? Touch ID um, that is actually in screen and a foldable iPhone. Both of those are going to be delayed. And I think it's respective to 2023 and 2024 Bloomberg's Mark Gurman reported last month that Apple worked on an under display version of touch ID for the iPhone 13, but it didn't make the cut for the product's release. Cool believes that a foldable iPhone will feature displays between 7.5 and eight inches, presumably folding in half like the galaxy fold and turn into an iPad mini sized tablet. In terms of more immediate rumors, Cool expects the iPhone 14 Pro to offer a hole punch style front camera rather than a notch with a 48 megapixel standard camera. Cool also expects a 5G iPhone SE in the first half of 2022. And I, I read all this and, it, you know, the story in between the lines is what's popping out to me. It sounds like that the iPhone like Samsung devices that happened a little earlier are, are becoming very utilitarian. I don't think you're going to see any big major shifts in what the iPhone is or what it does other than a little bit faster, a little bit better um, battery, uh, maybe a little bit better uh, camera. But these are basically square pieces of glass that do really, really cool things that just don't get updated significantly so from year to year. And I think that that's what we're seeing, that they're pushing out things that we thought were going to be here this year out until the year after next, if not the year after that. Well, and a lot of folks have already said this about the iPhone 13. It's camera's very impressive. You got a terabyte of storage if you can afford that or want it, you know, on, on, the, on the Pro. But it's somewhat incremental. The phone doesn't really do much that the iPhone 12 did, you know, both very high-end phones. Now, you, you might be like me. I'm still rocking a 10X Max, so I really am, I'm, I haven't bit the bullet yet, but 
really considering the iPhone 13, because to me, that's a nice big step up. I don't really see 2022 besides if the 5G iPhone SE rumor comes to pass in the first half of 2022. It's like if the, there's a foldable phone to get excited about and an under display version of Touch ID isn't happening, you know, anytime relatively soon. What, a, you know, the, what do you what do you get more well, more megapixels? OK, well, but I, I think Apple has been kind of planning for this as we've seen life cycles of these, you know, people kind of going from that two year cell contract model of I got to upgrade every two years to, hey, I'm getting three, four or five years out of, you know, a device. And it's, you know, it's not like a, a hellscape to use that thing for the last year or something like that. And because we're moving into this more commodified uh, uh, market with this, you know, it kind of it, the, traditionally it's like, OK, Apple sales ramp up you know, the quarter after the release in, in Q4, like right now they trail off, you know, the quarter before. I, I think Apple would be fine is if they could flatten that out and be, basically be like, yeah, the iPhone 14 is coming out, but I need a phone now. And, you know, okay, so the camera will have a few less megapixels and stuff like that. My big thing with, I was thinking about this reading the story, is 2024, is Apple then significantly late to the foldable game? And I was thinking about this in terms of like, it feels like, this generation, the the Z Fold three and the Fold whatever, uh, th those are. This is the first time it feels like a product as opposed to a tech demo, at least in my eyes. And I was reminded I was at a party the other day and someone had an original uh, Galaxy Fold and you know it kind of pulled out his pocket and unfolded it. And like several people there, like free, like they had never seen or heard of a foldable before. And it was like literally watching someone experience a new product category made me realize, oh no. We're still so early with this that I feel like 2024, yeah, that's a long way away. I mean, three years of, is an eternity in technology. I feel like if they can deliver something and say, hey, it's it meets all of our IPX ratings, it's not going to break. I mean, you know, <laughs> who knows? But well, I, and I, don't, I don't necessarily will, think that feels late even by this standard. Apple will create the world's best foldable phone, says Apple. <laughs> yeah. Just give them until 2024. And it's not too late because it's not like Apple users are going to switch and you know I'm going to switch from Apple to go get that Samsung device. That, that that's not really happening right yeah. now. Yeah. Well, folks, sometimes you just don't have time to listen to DTNS. And although we love to have you, we understand. If you want just the headlines, good news. You can check out our related show, Daily Tech Headlines, all the essential tech news in about five minutes. Check it out at dailytechheadlines.com. All right, let's get into these Amazon rumors. Well, maybe more than rumors, kind of more like leaks. Amazon appears to have leaked new versions of its Kindle Paperwhite e-reader. A comparison chart published to Amazon's Canadian and Mexican sites shows a $150 Canadian dollar Kindle Paperwhite and a $210 Canadian dollar Paperwhite Signature Edition with 6.8 inch, 300 PPI, 17 LED displays, and an adjustable warm light much like the Kindle Oasis. Current paper white models have six inch displays with four LEDs, so it would be a significant bump. Make it a lot brighter. The signature edition appears to add wireless charging and also auto adjusting light sensors. This has not been officially announced by Amazon, so features and pricing are obviously not final. Still, while it is larger, a brighter display, also not a bad thing, Matt Wiley over at Input argues that kind of points to a continual lack of innovation by the e-reader market leader. Kindles hold about 80% of the e-reader market share, at least in the US. But he argues the devices have kind of remained fundamentally the same since they launched back in 2011. First gen keyboard, don't have that anymore. Otherwise, not a lot of huge design differences or really much under the hood either. The Kindle took years to add new simple features like display cover. Smaller competitors, such as Kobo and Remarkable, are pushing the envelope with screen sizes and stylus support and functionality that goes beyond just being an e-reader. Yeah, and it kind of asks that question of, is this a, a utility object that, okay, the, the only point of this, of an e-reader in Amazon's mind, is to connect you to their marketplace to buy a book, provide a, a nice, uh, fine reading experience. You know, they have made innovations. I would say the paper white was kind of the last big one where people are like, oh, that fundamentally improves my ability to read this in a more book-like fashion, stuff like that. Um, but, you know, in Amazon's mind, this is, this is a like utility device. Like we know what an e-reader should be. 
Whereas, you know, Kobo and Remarkable are saying, uh, you know, hey, e-ink has very unique properties that can, you know, uh, replicate not just the look, but even the feel of the paper in some instances when you're talking about adding style of support, taking notes and that kind of stuff. And I think those are two competing visions that there, there clearly is a lot of frustration out there. Obviously, the the e-reader market is enough that Amazon's continuing to invest some form of. I mean, you know, these are fundamentally new products. Uh, after all, even if the functionality behind them isn't the same, but I definitely, you know, I'm an e-reader stan. I love I love me some e-ink. I want to see e-ink on all the things, but. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I can definitely understand the frustration of being, you know, what what the Kindle could be uh, versus, you know, what we've kind of the updates we've kind of received. I think Amazon kind of nailed it with the Kindle White. I mean, the device, it it is very good at what it does. And for, from a from an Amazon standpoint, this supports their business of selling you ebooks. Um, they're not trying to, we need to corner the market on selling these devices. We need to corner the market on where you buy your books from. So because of that, there's not really been a reason for them to iterate and upgrade because it's not like, you know, folks are saying, oh, I'm going to leave Kindle, um, you know, <laughs> eBooks. If I go to some other reader, you're just going to get another device that they really haven't updated in, in some time. So it's probably going to take other companies to really innovate and come up with these e you know these you know paper white or these e you know e ink type you know stylized driven devices that you can use to take notes and all those kind of things. That's not really Amazon's wheelhouse. So I, I don't want to say that they don't care, but it's just it's just not a market that they're really targeting, at least not right now. Having the remarkable two uh, uh, e e e-tablet. I don't think they actually called it e-reader. I don't have it next to me right now, which is going to be my next live with it segment, by the way. I know it's a little delayed. <laughs> Once I get my life together, I promise. Um, I have lots of thoughts on the Remarkable 2. I think it's it's an amazing productivity tool. It is an e-reader second or third. Um, it, it can be. You have to know a little bit. Uh, there's some fancy footwork that gets something that would be in you know, a Kindle store, for example, you know, you like get it from your local library and there's some EPUB and you got to convert some formats and everything. It can be done. DTNS audience can certainly handle that. Uh, but it's, it's, it's much more of a productivity tool and a way to not really be online. I mean, you can sync it to, to get documents off of whatever computer you sync it to, but otherwise you don't have apps, you don't have a browser. You're supposed to be kind of focused and, and doing your thing. It is awesome though, um, and the the stylus that it comes with is remarkable. Sorry, pardon the pun, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's there's just so much more to it, and I think that once something becomes that and also an e-reader, then you get into you get into much more of a well, now it's a tablet competitor, and so why isn't it just a tablet? Following up on a successful Kickstarter campaign, Incubate Games confirmed it's bringing its unreleased Game Boy Color Tactical RPG Infinity to the Game Boy Advance, Steam, and the Nintendo Switch. The GBA title will be a direct port of the game, while the Steam Switch version will receive an enhanced version. Work on the game in 1999 by Athenix Software, but it was canceled in 2002. Um, Kind of building on a really interesting trend. I mean, the fact this is a Game Boy Color game and it's still going to be coming out for what could be considered a vastly legacy console in the advance. Yeah, they're, they're going to be bringing some advancements too here. Uh, generally interesting or millennial nostalgia, I guess, at this point, Rob? So there's probably a certain type. You and I probably fit the mold for this. <laughs> I love this because, you know, one thing I can say, I have been a good steward for pretty much most of my tech. I have going back to the eighties, like my second or third computer, I have most of my game boys, you know, I've, ha I've literally had all of them. I still have like my original Atari, not my original. I have a Atari 5,600, um, that still is in working condition. If somebody was to make a cartridge for that joint, I'd pop it in there tomorrow. So <laughs> yeah, I have the tech to be able to, you know, to use these games. So if somebody's going to actually give me a new cartridge to throw into my Game Boy, that's great. If somebody's going to give me a new game that was, em, you know, that was to emulate a Game Boy, I probably would try it out because those old games, in, in, in my estimation, some of them are some of the best games that were ever created. So, you know, I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, I was going to add, like, uh, this is not something entirely 
new. This is something that is, uh, uh, this is something that's been in kind of what they call the uh, uh, the retro gaming scene uh, for a while. It started out with orphan consoles like the Atari Jaguar. Remember that, um, where a lot of dedicated users have gotten around and decided that uh, making their own games. Uh, for these kind of uh, op, well, most people consider obsolete consoles would be a nice way to kind of uh, keep that system going, keep that kind of uh, uh, video gaming experience alive. And it's really cool to see him do it with 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 the Game Boy because it's it is a system that a lot of people have fond memories about, and uh, and a nice way to kind of keep it going. Yeah, like I said, I, you know, I'm just sitting here thinking of games. I would definitely go back and play. Uh, Game Boy Advance or Game Boy Color games. So, um, you know, the, to me, these are these are kind of awesome. And it plays really into that whole um, uh, what is the company Analog that's making FPGA compatible consoles and stuff like that. That you know, it, there's clearly an interest to play both the legacy games and you know, if we can, uh, even though some of these are you know maybe proprietary or or, or tough to like physically make the cartridges for. Uh, definitely an interest to keep like not just ROMs and emulators alive, but like the physical experience of like cartridge console gaming alive. Uh, and so, uh, hey, we'll be get a chance for that with uh, Infinity. And I do love me a tactical RPG. So let's uh, do a quick jump over to uh, Nika Mumford, who has this month's uh, 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 Teching World Black segment and. Uh... Let me just play this up right Hi, this is Nika Momford of the Snobble West Show with another episode of Teching While Black. In this segment, I bring awareness to an innovative Black leader in technology. This week's spotlight is Allende Alakoye. He is the founder and CEO of Needle, as in a haystack, which is a social audio platform. Needle, according to his website, is, quote, the first social audio platform in the world to provide live transcripts that make audio accessible for everyone, end quote. Additionally, the social audio platform provides a unique URL equipped with SMS alerts, the ability to take callers, and more. Needle is one of 12 startups in Google's inaugural Voice AI Accelerator and it's raised $1.6 million thus far. Now, this isn't Allende's first foray into app development. He is the creator of the original iHeartRadio mobile app. Also, he serves as an executive board member of the Applications Development Alliance. In addition to his contributions to the tech space, he is a renowned radio and television speaker, as well as a panel and keynote speaker. He has appeared at CBS TV and radio, CNBC, and the National Association of Broadcasters. So his extensive speaking abilities are kind of understandable, as he served as a speechwriter, staffer, and message advisor for former President Barack Obama. Let me just say this. I think we should all keep an eye out on Needle, as it appears to be a true force in the making. To find out more about Allende Alakoye and his work, you can follow him on Twitter at ThatAllende and at Needle.com. Join me next time as I highlight another Black tech innovator. When we are aware of all innovative voices, especially those in underrepresented groups, the tech community thrives. Thank you, Nika. Very well said. Uh, reminder to everybody, if you've got ideas for topics we should talk about, uh, questions about anything we did talk about or anything in between, do send us those emails. We want more. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We also want to thank just a few brand new bosses. In fact, all six of you. John Spencer, Alan G Gallang, Robert Wolfington, Jachen Sievert, Samuel Jackson Royal, and Brian Holtz, all who just started backing us on Patreon. So a big thanks to John, Alan, Robert, Jochen, Samuel, and Brian. It's good stuff. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's a, that's a solid weekend uh, over on Patreon. Thank you so much. Let's keep this streak going, shall we? Also, thanks to you, Rob Dunwood, for being with us this fine Monday. You are a busy podcaster these days. Let folks know where they can keep up. 
So I am at all things Rob Dunwood, and you can find me at the SMR podcast, actually smrpodcast.com. And my brand new show that I host with uh, Brother Tech and Tech Life Steph um, called The Tech John at thetechjohn.com. So check us out. Very cool. We are live on this show Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. If you want to know more, check out dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Join us live if you can. We'd love to have you. Tom will be back tomorrow and we'll be joined by Lamar Wilson. See you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>